Tonight on KQED Newsroom, special guest Congress member Jared Huffman on what he's doing to combat climate change and the major economic wranglings this week in Washington, D.C. Plus, a new statewide vaccine mandate for children and what happens next as the state's eviction moratorium expires. We'll get more from our political experts. And we admire the art and architecture of the Palace of Fine Arts in this week's look at something beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, October 1st, 2021. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. Let's kick off our show with the Friday Five, a look at some of the week's top news stories in California. Governor Gavin Newsom announced today that California will be the first state in the nation to require a COVID-19 vaccination for all eligible children in public and private schools pending full FDA approval for each age group. Newsom also signed a slate of significant new housing and police reform bills into law this week. California still has the lowest coronavirus case rate in the nation and has administered more vaccines than any other state. This week, a judge ruled that all employees at California prisons must be vaccinated. However, the Delta variant is slowing California's economic outlook. A new forecast from UCLA economists pulls back on earlier optimism, which had predicted a national growth rate of 5%. They now predict a lower but still solid growth rate of 4.1% for 2022. During the pandemic, California banned landlords from evicting tenants for not paying their rent. That ban ends today, but tenants with unpaid rent can still stay in their homes if they've applied for the state's rent relief program. Thousands of Californians endangered coho salmon are being tended through a Petaluma High School fish hatchery program. The students took the salmon in when the water in their usual home, a hatchery at Lake Sonoma, became too warm. We're, we're helping to save this endangered species, and especially coming out of COVID, where we were locked in a house with um, Zoom and distance learning. It's awesome to see what hard work, what getting out there, what getting our hands dirty. It's empowering to us to see what we can really do and how much we can help the environment. And that's this week's Friday Five. Later, I'll be joined by Congress member Jared Huffman. But first, the impacts of climate change are being felt throughout the state in the form of bigger wildfires, deeper droughts, and longer heat waves. In the San Francisco Bay Area, the community of East Palo Alto is preparing for another kind of climate impact, rising sea levels. Built on the edge of rolling wetlands, this town is figuring out how to adapt to potential flooding and storms. KQED climate reporter Ezra David Romero has this story. East Palo Alto is surrounded by water on three sides, the bay on two sides, and a creek on the other. 20 years ago, high tides and heavy storm rains combined to breach a levee here and devastated entire neighborhoods in East Palo Alto. The 1998 flood was certainly significant and very scary. We had thousands of people who had to be moved from their homes, but future flooding, if we don't do what we're are proposing to do today could lead to major catastrophic just raising of homes. That's because climate scientists warn that warming causing rising seas could increase the water level of San Francisco Bay by around two feet by 2030 and seven feet by 2100. It could exacerbate flooding in areas already prone to it, such as East Palo Alto. There are large Latino, Black, and Pacific Islander communities in this two and a half square mile city. East Palo Alto has a very large low income population that participates in the service sector for Silicon Valley. We work cleaning your homes, we work in your restaurants. Those lower income jobs that because of the pay, people cannot live any other place in Silicon Valley, but they can live here. It's a low income community. 
A lot of these families don't have savings. A lot of these families, a climate extreme may tip, you know, their ability to stay together. By sea level rise. Violet Wufsa Enna is preparing East Palo Alto residents for climate change. She migrated to the Bay Area from the Pacific Islands of Samoa, where she was the country's first climate change officer. After listening to community leaders, the Matais, the village leaders there, the last thing they wanted to do is to leave their ancestral land. So we ended up building a seawall um, to protect the village, and the whole community supported the project, even provided resources and labor. So Here too, she says, residents are eager to stay. To Mayor Carlos Romero notes while the city and local agencies have made significant improvements, including rebuilding building part of this levee. Three quarters of their land remains unprotected from rising seas. I am very confident that it will get done, number one, because there's political will, but probably more importantly, there is a resurgence of community interest and activism to make sure that flooding will not displace us. Even as East Palo Alto improves its infrastructure and braces for climate change, many locals fear another kind of incursion from real estate developers looking for their next big profitable project. East Palo Alto is peppered with new development. This lot here has five big homes going up on it. The next one over has about four. A lot of these projects being proposed, we are doing our best to engage the community in these conversations, to build community capacity to participate so that they can voice their concerns. For the mayor, it's a matter of making sure solutions are for all in East Palo Alto. The levees for East Palo Alto represent, number one, a physical structure, its protection, but it has more symbolic meaning. And that symbolic meaning is care and nurturing of a community that is here and that deserves to be nurtured and that deserves to be protected, just like any other higher income community around the Bay. This work holds promise for residents in East Palo Alto, but it won't be finished for about a decade. And while levees are slowly being built, the seas are still predicted to continue to rise. In East Palo Alto, I'm Ezra David Romero for KQED Newsroom. As that story points out, action needs to be taken now to be prepared for the future. California has 3,000 miles of coastline to consider when it comes to sea level rise. Our next guest is the United States House Representative for the entire northern coastline, from Marin to our northern border with Oregon, Congress member Jared Huffman. Huffman serves as the chair of the Water, Oceans and Wildlife Subcommittee, where he's focused on combating climate change. Congress member Huffman joins us now from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show. Thanks, good to be with you. Well, you are in Washington, D.C., where it's been a big week of political wrangling, but let's start by focusing here on California on the coastline. Can you tell me about how sea level rise is going to impact our state overall? Well, it's near and dear to me because that map you just showed says it all. I represent about a third of the California coast. So up and down my district, I have communities and sensitive ecosystems and public lands and everything else uh, that could be greatly threatened by sea level rise. Um, but even beyond that, you know, the state of California has enormous threats uh, from sea level rise, including our water supply. You've got uh, something close to 30 million people in this state that get at least some of their water from the Delta, uh, which is gonna change uh, with the incursion of salt water with sea level rise, that's gonna make it harder to guarantee water quality for millions of Californians. So we, we just have all kinds of things to consider when we think about resiliency, when we think about the impacts that this presents. Well, we shared a report about how one city, East Palo Alto, is addressing sea level rise, but it seems like there needs to be more regional solutions rather than these piecemeal approaches. So what else is being done? So each community is gonna have to start identifying critical infrastructure. Uh, just last week, I was touring uh, a low-lying road in Marin County. If you've uh, ever been to China Camp State Park, you've driven this beautiful road that goes right along the wetland on the bay. It is basically at sea level. In fact, in high tides and storms, it's underwater. Mm. Uh, I could point to any number of places like that around Marin, places in Sausalito where roadways will now flood You know, on a sunny day just uh, with, with tidal conditions uh, being just right. So this issue is not some distant 
uh, thing. It is here and now, and it's going to be coming faster. So, Identifying but Congress that member, are there structure is key. Are there are there regional projects that are bringing together these communities that are scattered all along the coastline uh, that, yeah, I'll, that I'll are give looking you an example to the future? Of one. Yeah, sure. Uh, Highway 37 would be a great example of one critical transportation artery for the North Bay, and uh, it is basically at sea level. Um, between Marin and Sonoma County right now. And it too, you know, floods uh, during storm conditions, the roads starting to wash out in storms. Um, we, we're gonna have to raise that roadway and it's not gonna, going to be cheap. It's gonna cost a lot of money, but uh, we're looking at it as an opportunity because we don't wanna just use concrete uh, to try to build our way to resiliency. We wanna use natural systems and living shorelines and that's a great example of a place where we can elevate our infrastructure uh, above where sea level rise would threaten it and also restore the connectivity for these wetlands and uh, allow the wetlands to do a little bit of flood buffering for us mm -hmm. and to protect other parts of, of the community. So um, it's, it's gonna be expensive, it's hard to do, but it's also an opportunity. So you've talked about needing to protect our water supply. We obviously have these infrastructure issues that we need to deal with as well. Let's go to DC and talk about these infrastructure bills that are being fought over right now. There's one that's a smaller bill, $1.2 trillion, if you can call that small, and then a larger one that's $3.5 trillion. And, and these are sort of working their way through the system, but in terms of what they have in those bills, is there money that would come to California for these issues? There is some, uh, absolutely. And frankly, the most important piece of this package is in the Build Back Better Act, the one that we hope will pass through the budget reconciliation process. The other one um, is really more about our, our traditional existing infrastructure, hardening the electricity grid, um, repairing problems with our existing water systems. There is some drought relief funding and resiliency money in there. There's some broadband internet expansion money in there. That's really good. Um, but the other piece of this conversation, Priya, that I, I wanna uh, remind us of is this is part of the climate crisis. That's the reason we're talking about sea level rise. So, you know, just coming up with more expensive band-aids uh, without doing something about the cause of the climate crisis is not a very good response. Um, of the two bills we're considering in this package, one of them is not great on climate. That bill that came out of the Senate actually has a bunch of concessions to the fossil fuel industry. This the is Build the Build Back Better package. Act that I am holding out to try to pass is where we're hopefully going to make really bold investments in clean energy in that transition away from fossil fuels so that we can stop making this worse. So you and a group of other progressive Democrats have blocked that smaller bill from coming forward to a vote. And you've said that you want to make sure that it is linked with the larger bill. And really that you're using this as leverage. If you, if you vote yes on this bill, the smaller 1.2 trillion, that you think you won't be able to get what you want out of the larger bill. Yeah, and the reason for that is that Senate bill is a, a final vote. If we vote yes on it, it goes to the president's desk and becomes law. That bigger Build Back Better Act still has to work its way through both houses. It's not fully developed. So to give that, give that bill that Joe Manchin wants, if I could just be very candid, um, what you're really doing is putting the second bill on a much more uncertain track that many of us believe could even be doomed for failure. So there is a number that's come from the moderate Democrats saying they're looking at more of a $1.5 trillion number rather than $3.5 trillion. Would you be willing to vote for a bill that is less than $3.5 trillion? I am far less concerned about these numbers than I am what's in the bill. Um, and, and, you know, folks throw these numbers around like they have some intrinsic value. They really <laughs> don't. Uh, what does have value are the programs and the investments that we've identified as key priorities. And so what we have said to Senator Manchin and anyone else that has concerns about the package, tell us what you don't support. That's a harder conversation because everything in that package is really important and really popular. But we're beginning to have that conversation. And it may be that we can include most of what we've put into that bill and just find some creative ways to do it that closes the deal. So what is the next step here? How do we get towards a place where we can actually move these bills forward and then see implementation? 
Well, I will be meeting with the President of the United States in about uh, 45 minutes. He's coming to our Democratic caucus meeting. And I think he's trying to make sure that we continue to focus on the broad unity that actually is there, despite this narrative of chaos and disarray and conflict. Most of us want to pass both of these bills. Um, we've just got to complete some difficult negotiations to get it done. And I think the best path forward for success is not to decouple these bills, not to take one piece of it and go ahead and finalize it while leaving the other piece hanging. We've got to stay the course, honor the original deal, and I hope that's the message the president brings to us today. All right, U.S. House Representative Jared Huffman, thank you for your time and good luck today. Thank you. This week, key safety net programs put into place because of the pandemic are sunsetting in California. They include programs for rent relief and sick leave protections. Also, under a new bill, every registered California voter will automatically receive ballots by mail in the future. And speaking of voting, we're set to see another special election soon as Assemblymember David Chu leaves Sacramento to become San Francisco's next city attorney. Joining us now to talk about this week in California politics are KQED politics and government senior editor Scott Schaefer and correspondent Marisa Lagos. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks, so it's been a crazy week in Washington, lots and lots of talk, some action, but we've still got a long way to go there. There's a long way to go. This is a game of maybe four dimensional chess. There's huh. four big balls that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is trying to keep up in the air without dropping. The one thing they did do this week is they funded the government through December 3rd. Yay, that's, no government shutdown. No government shutdown, <laughs> yeah, no IOUs. Yeah. So that's a big thing. You know, and, and it shows that it's kind of like ho-hum, but that's the magnitude of these things. The next thing they have to do is raise the debt ceiling. That'll probably be the last thing they do. They've got a trillion dollar infrastructure bill that's bipartisan, already passed the Senate. The House progressives are holding that up because they want to make sure the fourth thing, this $3.5 billion Build Back Better plan with a lot of economic programs that they care about in climate change, they want to make sure that doesn't get forgotten once the, once the infrastructure bill passes. So. Yeah. So we just had Jared Huffman on who was speaking about that, um, Congress member Jared Huffman. Do you think that they're actually going to make progress and get to a point at which they pass something beyond the smaller package, the 3.5? Where will that end up? I mean, it's hard to know where it'll end up. It's probably going to be smaller than that. And I would say likely bigger than the $1.5 trillion that uh, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, one of the more moderate Democrats, who's really kind of at the thick of these negotiations. That's what he wants. We saw that plan from Manchin leak out this week, which I think some... Uh, sort of DC observers think might be indication that there's some negotiations happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's important for Democrats isn't the number per se, but what's in it. What are the direct relief that they can be offering to families, that they can show their cards in the 22 midterms and say, hey, we promised, you know, we promised to go out after child care. We promised to go after climate change and we actually yeah. got that stuff done. And it's this is a huge test for Nancy Pelosi, of course. And this, she called this the fun part this week in Washington. And this she, is her fun. This is her idea of fun. And I think, <laughs> she, I think it times. is, I think yeah. it is. You know, she really thrives on, I mean, she, you know, the Affordable Care Act would not have passed without Nancy mm -hmm. Pelosi. She knows how to get votes and count votes, cajole people. She knows where to compromise, where not. Mm -hmm. So I think if anybody can get this done, it's her, uh, but, there's a lot of work to do. Well, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from the both of you asking her directly how it went in a couple of weeks. Yeah, she's going to be here on the 13th. Right, less than two weeks away. So hopefully this will all be buttoned up by then and we can talk to her about how the sausage was made. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, lawmakers often wait till the last minute. We, they need that pressure. Yeah. We did see the president meeting with a lot of uh, members of Congress just today, Friday. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is hope on the Democratic side that yeah. this actually happens. Yeah. Well, and I think if, if they are to do well in the midterms, they have to show they've done something. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece of pressure. Yeah. You know, another interesting angle that came out yesterday, an interesting uh, piece of personal story, was from three Congress members who shared their story about their own abortions. And one of them was Congress member Barbara Lee. Yeah. Uh, what was this about and why did they come and share these very personal and heart-wrenching stories? Yeah, this was a House Oversight Committee hearing. It was essentially called to sort of bring attention to the attacks on abortion rights we're seeing in states across the country, mm -hmm. most notably in Texas, obviously, uh, but there's also another Supreme Court case that's being taken up in the coming months. Um, yeah, Barbara Lee talked about going to Mexico when she was 16. This was before the Roe v. Wade SCOTUS decision. Said she had a back alley Mexico abortion. Mm -hmm. Pramila Jayapal talked. Corey Bush 
bush talked um, really emotional and I think that what you're seeing is this effort by folks who do support reproductive rights to put those stories out there and to make it clear that this isn't just a sort of idea or something that only happens to some people that this is actually pretty common and if you look at polling most Americans do support safe abortion access yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's also it's this is a good issue, so to speak, for Democrats. Uh, there's, you know, as Marisa said, it polls well, but it's also, it, one, it kind of pushes back, kind of reminds people, I think, that it's mostly Republican men mm -hmm. who are making these decisions about women's bodies, and that's not a bad thing to because remind Because of voters. the representation in the House yeah. and the Senate. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let's go to some California state news, because we had big news today, where Governor Newsom is saying all children in the state who go to public or private schools must be vaccinated pending FDA approval of the vaccination right. for their age group. It would be the following term. So there are a few, you know, steps Hurdle here. Still, right. Yeah. right. But this is a big, big announcement and certainly one that he would not have made before the recall election. Well, you know, watching him today, he seemed very confident and very calm. I mean, this is basically what he ran on in the recall. You know, he said, look, you can do this, what I'm doing with the mandates and all, or you can have Larry Elder, who's going to roll everything back. So clearly he feels confident. He feels he's on solid footing. You know, there is a big ramp up time. I think probably uh, they're guessing that uh, by July of 2022 is when 7th through 12th graders will start to be vaccinated. But it does put everybody on notice. It gives uh, school districts and parents a chance to kind of get ready for this. I think parents are ready now in many places. And so I think he said today we're the first state, but I'm sure we won't be the last. And I, I think he's right about that. Right. And what we've seen in California and elsewhere is the majority of Americans are interested in getting vaccinated, have gotten vaccinated. And so while there are loud voices opposing it, I don't think you're going to see you might see some court challenges but we probably won't see the same sorts of uh, demonstrations at least at the local level if this is a statewide mandate and another issue that he has spoken on frequently and he's really made a lot of steps towards changing is housing and homelessness uh, and so this week he signed 21 new 27. bills is that right? 27 <laughs> new bills um, on reducing homelessness on increasing housing there's 22 billion dollars worth of funding yeah. going towards this it's a good time to be building housing I guess if because it is expensive yeah. and there is a lot of extra money how long that money is going to be around some of it was one-time money from the federal government. But, you know, Newsom ran for government promising 3.5 million new units of housing mm -hmm. by the time he leaves office after eight years. They're, they're nowhere near that now. Everyone agrees this is a big problem. It hurts the economy. It hurts working-class families. You know, parents can't afford to here buy a house in San Francisco and pay for school. You know, there's all these choices mm -hmm. people are having to make. And so these 27 bills are kind of a package of carrots and sticks, you know, to encourage more housing, but also to, with a promise, like if local governments don't meet their requirements, we'll take them to court. There's also been this ban on evictions, but that ends today. Are renters pretty concerned? Yeah, renters, people who advocate for renters, are very concerned that this could lead to ten potentially tens of thousands of evictions. This was, of course, a protection put in place during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it prevented landlords from evicting folks if they fall behind on rent. I mean, I mean, we should say that there are both state and federal assistance programs that are aimed at sort of helping tenants pay those arrears uh, bills. It's been hard to get that money out. We've seen at the federal level especially there's been a real disconnect between that money being allocated and it getting to renters. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to have to keep watching this space and see if the governor, you know, does change his mind and put anything else into effect. But for now, that has expired. All right, one last piece of legislation to touch on, which is police reform that happened this week. This is something uh, very much in the wake of the George Floyd killing and conviction of uh, Derek Chauvin, uh, SB2. Uh, this is a case where, unlike the vaccine mandate where California was first, we're almost last in creating a process in California where mm. bad cops who get fired for misconduct, incorrect use of force, that kind of thing, cannot, they can be decertified, so they can't just go off the road and get a job with another police department. That's been happening, and so you have these bad, this bad behavior being perpetuated in oftentimes smaller police departments. And so that and we should end with SB2 being signed. Of course, it's always easier said than done. And even though we're like the 47th state to do this, the police officers and other law enforcement groups opposed it. All right, so let's turn now to local politics here in San Francisco. Assemblymember David Chu is coming back from Sacramento to San Francisco. He's going to be the new city attorney. That's right. He was uh, named this week as Dennis Herrera, the city's longtime city attorney, is moving over to the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, Mayor Breed made that appointment earlier this year after the head of the PUC resigned because of corruption-related federal charges. Um, we're seeing, you know, Chu has spent a long time in the sort of civil rights space. He was a former prosecutor. 
voter before he ran for office. Um, and so I think a lot of the issues facing San Francisco, particularly housing, are really things that he is focused on in the legislature. Um, and I think, you know, when he takes office in November, we will see kind of what he wants to do with that office. Uh, Herrera led the fight for marriage yeah. equality. It's a it's a big job and it has the potential for yeah. wide ranging implications. Yeah, they have like 250 attorneys and so they can sort of put their stamp on that. I mean, there's also the nuts and bolts of government that they have to deal with. But, uh, you know, I think he's been, as Marisa said, a long uh, an advocate for immigrants, civil rights, LGBT rights. And so I think you're going to see him continue to do that. There's already a race to replace him in the, in the assembly, even though he hasn't taken over yet. Uh, David Campos, former supervisor, now chief of staff to the DA, Chesa Boudin is running, along with District 6 Supervisor Matt Haney. So there'll be another big election. Many elections. Not, uh, yeah. Lots to watch. <laughs> Lots to watch. To watch. Fun never stops. All right. Scott Schaefer, Marisa Lagos, thanks for coming on the show. We You're appreciate welcome. it. Pleasure. Yeah. The Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco was originally built for the 1915 Panama Pacific Exposition to showcase works of art. It was rebuilt from 1964 to 1974, and it's this week's edition of Something Beautiful. It includes a 162-foot-high rotunda that's ringed by colonnades and enclosed by a lagoon in the Marina District. And that's the end of our show for tonight. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens or email us at knr at kqed.org. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.